Now you might think for rotational spectroscopy that you can go from any uh, energy level to any other energy level. Remember that uh, rotational energy levels are quantized and they're described by a quantum number j uh, for molecular spectroscopy, j equals 0, j equal 1, and so on. These are not um, to scale. And you might think, well, we can go from the 0 to 1, or perhaps we go to the 0 to 2, or uh, 0 to 3. But it turns out there are selection rules, selection rules for rotational spectroscopy. And the selection rule is that delta J has to be plus or minus 1, and then delta M sub J has to be 0 or plus or minus 1. So in other words, you can only go, say, from here to here, or from here to here, or, no, go away there. My pen is going wild on me or go from, for example, here to here. But you cannot change uh, more than uh, one J unit. So this is not allowed by the selection rules. So where do these selection rules come from? Well, for the this delta J equal plus or minus one, this comes from conservation of angular momentum. So you have the system before, say, absorption of a photon. So you have the angular momentum with the photon and the angular momentum of the, of the molecule. And then afterwards, after the photon has been absorbed by the molecule, you have an angular momentum. And so the angular momentum before and after the absorption of the photon has to be equal. And from that, you get the uh, selection rule delta J equal plus or minus one and then uh, delta M sub J <laughs> delta M sub J that could be zero or plus or minus one so those things uh, come from the conservation of angular momentum there are two other things that you have to consider for selection rules one is that the molecule must have a dipole moment why is that well uh, here you have electromagnetic radiation and it's going this way and here the electric field is oscillating in the plane perpendicular or sorry uh, in the plane containing this vector and the oscillation here so you got plane polarized light now that plane the electric field that's oscillating this way has to interact with a dipole here's the molecule interact with the dipole on the molecule so if there's no dipole in the molecule, there can be no interaction. So therefore, molecules like O2 or N2, I guess that's a triple bond, there's a double bond, uh, these do not absorb a light uh, to generate rotational transitions. The reason is they do not have a dipole moment and therefore they cannot interact with the electric oscillating electric field of the light that's coming in. On the other hand, things like carbon monoxide or uh, hydrochloric acid, these things do undergo rotational transitions. All right, so for rotational transitions uh, from one state to another, if you look at uh, the molecule itself, if the molecule does not have a dipole moment, then you cannot have a transition between rotational energy states. And, um, and then we had, of course, the um, conservation of angular momentum. The third factor you have to consider for whether a, you have a transition or not is the symmetry arguments we talked about. So we have a transition dipole moment that's the integral over all space of the complex conjugate of the wave function uh, we'll write this final of the final state the Hamiltonian operator of the dipole moment times the wave function of the initial state and this has to contain must contain the A1 irreducible representation for the integral mu to not be equal to zero. If the integral doesn't contain 
if the integral doesn't contain a1, then it's equal to the transition dipole moment mu, and therefore the intensity absorption is equal to zero for mu equals zero by symmetry arguments. All right, so it's by symmetry. Of course, the transition dipole moment could be zero, for example, if uh, the j quantum number changes by more than one. All right, so those are three considerations you have to have to see whether you have a transition uh, when you have a, a rotator and electromagnetic light at the right frequency impinging on it. Must have a dipole moment, must have these uh, changes in quantum number, and the uh, transition dipole moment by symmetry should not equal zero. With this selection rule, then the allowed energies of the transitions where you start from j and go to j plus 1, or you uh, start from j plus 1 and you go to j, is just equal to 2b times j plus 1. Just let's show that. So recall that the energy of the jth is equal to b times j times j plus 1. So let's look at the change in energy when you go from the j state to the j plus 1 state. That's equal to the energy of the j plus 1 state minus the energy of the j state. And that's equal to b. And now we're going to substitute in here j plus 1 for j. So that's j plus 1 times j plus 1 plus 1. j is now j plus 1 minus j times j plus 1. We're starting from the j and then going to the j plus 1. We multiply this out and that should be a b in front of there. We take out the b, multiply this out, we have j squared plus j plus j plus j plus 1 <laughs> plus 1 minus, and we multiply this out, j squared minus j. Uh, the j squares will cancel out, one of the j's will cancel out. So this is we're left with b times 2j plus 2, or in other words 2b times j plus 1. So this tells you what the energy level separation is when you start from the j and go to the j plus 1. Well, let's uh, go ahead and plot that out. This will be energy going this way. Here we'll say this is the uh, j equals 0. This will be the j equal 1, 2, 3, and so on. And we said that the delta E, starting from j and going to j plus 1, that's equal to 2b times j plus 1. All right, so let's, then this is the energy level gap. So let's start with the j equals 0. This means go j equals 0 to j equal 1. This energy separation is 2b, or not to be, I don't know. And uh, that really is the question. And then uh, when we'll start with the j equal 1, j equal 1 to go to j equal 2, this will be 4b. So the energy level separation here is 4b. Let's try j equal uh, 2. We start from 2 to go to 3. That is, um, I believe, 6b. So this energy level here is 6b, and so on. 2, 4, 6, 8, 10b. Let's see what a spectrum would look like here. On this axis, we have energy. Spectrum always has intensity versus energy. And here is the... Um, Here's a line here occurring at, this absorption will occur at energy 2b. Here's another absorption that will occur at energy 4b. Here's another absorption that will occur at energy 6b. And so on. So what you predict for rotational spectroscopy is that you have a series of equally spaced lines whose separation is equal to 2b. And this line here is separated by 2b, and so on. Now the usefulness of this, and this by the way is a rigid rotator approximation. We're approximating the charge distribution as a dipole in the molecule and a whole bunch of other approximations. 
but with and a rigid rotator, the bond length doesn't change as you're rotating. But with all those assumptions, we predict that uh, we have a series of equally spaced lines separated by 2b. And recall that 2b, b is equal to h bar squared over 2i. And therefore, and I, I'll just write this down, cancel out the twos. This is h bar squared, and I is equal to the reduced mass mu times the r, the distance between the two nuclei, and there is the bond length. All right, so by measuring a rotational spectrum, measuring the separation between the two lines, we can then determine what the bond length is, and exa that's exactly what rotational spectroscopy is used for. So, you measure energies of the transitions. Uh, we do this in the gas phase, so we ignore collisions and other problems, but typically you put the molecule in a gas phase, do some microwave absorption spectroscopy, measure the energies corresponding to transitions between rotational energy levels. We determine from that B, and from that we determine molecular quantities, in particular the bond length. Uh, squaring the bond length and multiplying by reduced mass, we get the moment of inertia.